Okay, I'm Levin Nazarian from Thomas Jefferson University in uh, Philadelphia, and I just want to uh, speak on ultrasound first in the arena of sports medicine. So there are a wide array of sports injuries that can be seen with ultrasound, and uh, of course you could spend two hours talking about all of these, but just so you know that, that just about every structure that's likely to be injured in an athlete, we can have some way of assessing it under ultrasound imaging. Now what are the practical advantages of ultrasound? Well, you know, again, you always have to look at what's a competing or at least a complementary technique, and an MRI is the case in musculoskeletal imaging. And so we know already some of the practical advantages of ultrasound compared to MRI, certainly cost and availability. Portability has really changed things quite a bit in sports medicine because we can bring to the athletic fields and other points of service, just like we just heard in the austere environment. We could also bring it into the locker room, which can be an austere environment, um, and, uh, or on the uh, side of the field in order to diagnose injuries right at the point at which they occur. Better patient acceptance, and this has been looked at, that uh, patients prefer ultrasound over MRI in surveys. Uh, no, no contraindications, as, as we've already heard as well. Now, it's also important to understand that there is an imaging advantage of ultrasound versus MRI in the musculoskeletal system in that there is better spatial resolution. Ultrasound can simply see better detail on the, the image than in a standard MRI examination. How much better? Well, first of all, um, in a clinical MRI examination, the resolution is approximately 450 microns, okay, about half a millimeter. With a 10 megahertz probe, we can get about 150 microns out of ultrasound. So even with a 10 megahertz probe, there's three times the resolution of ultrasound versus MRI. But that's just with a 10 megahertz probe. Now we have 12, 13, 15, 17, et cetera. And uh, we can see architecture of tissues that will just look black on an MRI, but where on, on ultrasound we can see very fine details. So here's an example where we use this, uh, this fine resolution. This is somebody who had a uh, hip pain and had a negative open MRI, which was a very uh, you know, low quality, low resolution, and basically was suffering with, it was a runner who was just suffering with hip pain for, quite a, for, for over a year. This was just a normal hip labrum for comparison, this nice echogenic triangle here between the acetabulum and the head of the femur. And then this was the symptomatic side where we see that that nice echogenic triangle is, is macerated. There's a piece that's been ripped off the acetabulum here, and the whole thing is just very heterogeneous. One of the beauties of this situation is that labral tears are not always symptomatic, so we can take our finger with the ultrasound and press right on that spot and say, is that where you hurt? And when you get the affirmative answer, you know that that's the case. Now you may say, well, this is a very obvious abnormality. How come it wasn't seen on the MRI? Well, it was done, patient was claustrophobic, done on an open MRI, low quality, there was no contrast put in the joint, and so we were able to make the uh, definitive diagnosis on ultrasound. And this is something that happens on a daily basis multiple times. This is not an unusual situation at all in the, uh, in the athlete. Now we also make uh, use of the real-time capability very much in the MSK system. Dynamic imaging, you know, move the joints into different areas, and I'll show this uh, when I do a demo at lunchtime actually. We can correlate with the physical exam. So if you're reading an MRI and you see an abnormality, you have no idea whether that's the cause of the patient's pain or symptoms at all. But with ultrasound, we can do an ultrasound-guided palpation. And also guiding interventions, which is a lecture in and of itself. But the real-time nature of ultrasound lets you guide all kinds of interventions. Now this is just a simple example how where a dynamic imaging of ultrasound is so important. And this was a 16-year-old softball pitcher who had a problem that every time she uh, pitch, she would get very painful clicking on the lateral part of her elbow. Now she had an x-ray, she had an MRI, they were negative, and nobody could figure out the cause of the clicking. On ultrasound, we didn't see much. This was her right elbow, her left elbow, relatively uh, symmetric. However, what we had her do is go through her pitching motion and try to get her imaged. We just told her to say now when she felt the click. And when she said now, what happened was that the head of the radius here subluxed, it, it, it partially dislocated out of the joint towards the probe, and it occurred very quickly and created a click. 
so that this bone was no longer lining up with this bone, the capitellum with the radius. And so we were able to tell in real time that this is the patient's problem. Now, how else would you have been able to diagnose this? Well, the only thing I could think of is fluoroscopy, which is radiation. You'd be radiating a 16-year-old for no reason. And if you had ultrasound first, you would not have a delayed diagnosis because she had gone through already months of this clicking without an answer. And uh, I could argue that you could have practically just taken it to the field and say, okay, let's see you, the click, let's make the diagnosis. And it would have saved her a lot of, uh, saved a lot of money and time and pain for her. Here's another such situation, a 21-year-old tennis player with shoulder pain for one year. Now, this is more dramatic than the last case in that uh, she had an MRI which called a slap lesion, which is a labral tear in the shoulder. And she had an arthroscopy based on the MRI, which did not see a slap lesion. So what they did was they took out the bursa in her shoulder and they, they did a capsulography. They basically uh, did surgery on the capsule of the shoulder. She got uh, no improvement at all in her symptoms. This is a Division I tennis player, by the way. The MRI repeated was negative. Okay, so now what? Well, you know what, now what? Ultrasound, right? So again, we're in a situation now where somebody's had two MRIs and surgery and still without a diagnosis, still unable to play tennis. So she came to a sports medicine colleague of mine and we did an ultrasound together. And we saw this little line going through. This is a rotator cuff here. We saw this dark line going through. Now the bursa, um, side of, this is the bursa side of the tendon, and we thought it was suspicious for a tear, but now the burden of proof was on us because she had already had all this testing without a diagnosis. So we put, again, the real-time nature, we put in a little bit of saline into the bursa over that area. Then we took the needle out, and we took a look and saw what was there, and in fact there was a tear of the bursal side of her rotator cuff right at that location. So here's somebody who's been through two MRIs, surgery, still in pain, and an ultrasound test with a little installation of saline that took basically five minutes um, to instill the saline and make this diagnosis, uh, made the diagnosis for her. So, you, well, why did they miss this at surgery? Well, they went in on the joint side with the arthroscope, not on the bursal side. The joint side of the cuff is normal. It's the bursal side that's abnormal. And this was, uh, so she went on to have uh, a treat, uh, treatment for that rotator cuff tear. Now, how good is ultrasound for uh, rotator cuff tears? We published this meta-analysis in 2009, and um, just, I'll just cut to the chase, and uh, this is the summary table. So ultrasound and MRI are essentially equivalent for rotator cuff tears. There was no significant difference. Now, MR arthrography was a little bit better at both, but MR arthrography requires instilling gadolinium into the joint, and that is something which is a somewhat invasive technique. So that's something that, uh, you know, so if you're just comparing ultrasound with MRI, they're equivalent. So when tests are equivalent, you should order the more, the cheaper test, right? I mean, at least that's how we feel. And how much would ordering the cheaper test actually help? We d uh, published this paper in 2008, and the, the premise behind this paper is we wanted to explore, if we substituted, substituted ultrasound for MRI for musculoskeletal disorders, um, we, how much would we save? So we described the recent use and costs of MSK imaging. This was actually in a Medicare population, because that's where we had the data. And we projected those trends to 2020. And we estimated cost savings involved in substituting MSK ultrasound for MRI where appropriate. So um, we computed the utilization of MSK imaging, we predicted the future rates of use, we estimated the cost of MSK imaging, and we estimated what proportion of MSK ultrasound could be substituted for currently done MRI. And, um, and then we computed the cost savings. So this is a table from that chart. I, I just want to show this just to show, uh, from that paper, I mean, just to show uh, this was utilization 2010, 2015, 2020 projected, and it was projected in 2020 there'd be over a 100% increase in CT and MR compared to 2005. Ultrasound would be going up 75% at the current rate with x-ray just slightly above that. But you can see that certainly the most expensive modality MRI would be 120% increased at the current rate. And then uh, we had an expert panel decide how many of those MRIs could be substituted for, by ultrasound, with ultrasound instead, and uh, these are the percentages by body part without getting too much into the details of how this was determined. But basically, 
we estimated that by 2020, the potential yearly cost savings by substituting MSK ultrasound for MRI, where appropriate, could reach $736 million just in that year. And a 15-year period uh, saving could be $6.9 billion. And this is, not, this is just for substituting ultrasound for, for things that it's been shown to be at least as accurate as, as uh, MRI, such as for rotator cuff, such as for Achilles tendon tears. We were very conservative in the types of tests that we would accept, OK, ultrasound could be done instead of MRI for that indication. So why would you save so much money? Well, the rapid increased use of MRI is one reason, with MRI use more than quintupled uh, in just from 96 to 2005, and then the low use of MSK ultrasound comparatively. And then, of course, the large cost difference between ultrasound and MRI, which may change as reimbursements start to change, but, uh, but still, you know, MRI will, will be more costly than ultrasound no matter what. Now, what are the challenges? So I want to speak extensively on these because we, you know, we've talked last night, ultrasound of the rotator cuff has been an emerging modality for almost 30 years. The first ultra paper on ultrasound of the rotator cuff was in the, uh, was in the early to mid 80s. So what are the challenges? Well, it is operator dependent, and we all know that. Of course, all imaging is operator dependent. And we, in fact, the operator dependence of MRI, I think, is understated. At a referral center, we commonly see MRIs that are misread or just poor quality. And this was brought up in a New York Times article uh, by uh, Gina Collada called The Scan That Didn't Scan. Basically, she had a stress fracture in her foot. She had an MRI, which didn't show it. And she hobbled along with other diagnoses and, and still in pain, et cetera. And then she went to an orthopedic surgeon and said, this is a lousy MRI. You've got to get a good MRI. And, and she said, well, good MRI? You know, the, the public has no idea. An MRI is an MRI. And, um, and so she, sort of a light bulb went off and she said, you mean, you know, you actually, this actually takes some technique to do and interpret? And this is an excerpt from that, uh, that article. Um, Radiology centers send written reports to doctors. The doctors have no idea whether the MRI was done well and interpreted well. And it's a huge problem, said of, um, William Black, who's a professor of radiology at Dartmouth. We find this to be a huge problem as well in our practice. Okay, next MSK ultrasound challenge, long learning curve. So sonographers may be insecure with the anatomy and pathology of the musculoskeletal system if they've not been exposed to it before. And MSK physicians may be insecure with ultrasound. Well, you know, this is it's well worth the effort, and that's why there's so many courses that have developed and, and online resources for teaching. It takes a lot of effort to be good at it, but it is definitely worth, worth it. Next, uh, crit uh, criticism or, or reason for not doing ultrasound requires a lot of physician time and input. Um, but you can train sonographers, if, uh, certainly, uh, as an, um, because uh, in our place, uh, ultrasound takes no more time than any, uh, MSK ultrasound takes no more time than any ultrasound that we do because we have sonographers who are well trained and of course now they can actually um, get, um, uh, take examinations as well in order to, uh, to have something to work toward during their training. Uh, next thing is MRI is already well established. And uh, MRI has a larger field of view, which makes certain people more comfortable seeing the big picture on every case. And the MRI images are often better understood by the referring clinicians, although this is improving, as well as there's more and more literature in, in every walk of life in medicine about how ultrasound uh, can be useful. But the main reason is right here. MRI reimburses more. This is the main challenge. I've always said that if ultrasound reimbursed four or five times as much as MRI, this probably would be an MRI first form instead of an ultrasound first form. <laughs> and I think that's really true. And that's really, I think, the major barrier uh, to, to acceptance by, uh, by, by, certainly by radiologists. So again, the general imaging paradigm, and we've already heard this already, Dr. Bernasov, et cetera, usually we like to do the less expensive test first and save the more expensive test when indicated. But an you know, example would be pelvic ultrasound and MRI. But in musculoskeletal imaging, we definitely do the more expensive test first, an MRI. And we do the less expensive test if indicated to, to answer the question. So we do it backwards. And here's. I'll leave you with this case. This, this is a 28-year-old woman who flew in to Philadelphia from Portland, Oregon, because there was no musculoskeletal ultrasound in her area. She was at her wit's end. She had intractable pain in her hip after she had femoral surgery for hip dysplasia. All her imaging studies were unrevealing, and I mean all. She came with a folder that was this thick 
with films of every type of imaging study you could possibly mention except for ultrasound. It's the one thing she didn't have. Now, she came without a note or anything. She just showed up and she heard, I heard you do ultrasound, please help me. Um, I said, well, I have to get a referral, please. So I called her and she said, yeah, do anything you want. She's, she's a little crazy, just, just do whatever you want. I mean, you, you know, won't find anything. But. All right, so one of our sonographers puts the uh, probe down. This is her asymptomatic left iliopsoas tendon, transverse longitudinal of a normal tendon. This was her symptomatic side. She had this screw. There were these threads on the screw. This is her iliopsoas tendon, and the tendon was tacked down to the screw. And every time she tried to move her leg, she would get this searing pain right at this location. This is an extended field of view, another technology that's helped ultrasound out, showing that this is the head of the screw, this is the bone, and then the screw bust right through the bone and was under her, her iliopsoas tendon, and her tendon was just adhered there. She had to, a 28-year-old on disability walking with a cane, no ultrasound in her area to, to speak of. And unfortunately, she'd had this already for a couple years, and she was disabled by it. They took the screw out eventually, a different surgeon, <laughs> and, um, and she was very grateful that her pain went away, although she never quite re recovered all of the function in her hip because she had so much muscle atrophy. All right, so ultrasound definitely, I should feel, should come first in sports medicine. I mean, radi you know, radiography, of course, you know, at this, in many cases as well, but certainly in terms of cross-sectional imaging, ultrasound first, cost-effective tool for MSK diagnosis and guiding intervention. I think for many indications, such as rotator cuff tears, it should be the first line imaging modality, depending on the patient's age. And for further reading, um, this was sort of my, uh, my laying out of what I thought were all the advantages of ultrasound as an important complementary or alternative tool to MRI. So I encourage you to take a look at that if you want to see more on this subject. And uh, thank you very much for your attention.